Thank you very much, Professor Brecher, and good morning to everyone. It's great to be here, and thanks for having me. Looking at my first slide, this is a rhinoceros hornbill, a beautiful bird that lives in the southwestern uh, part of Asia. And this bird has a very, very tough life. Because right in the beginning, he needs to find a female bird to mate with. That's the first challenge. He needs to look beautiful. And on the other side, he needs to make some noises, the maturing call, in order to make sure that he finds a bird. So once he found a female, the female sits in trees, trunks, in a nest, together with the chicks, takes care of them, and he needs, he needs to bring all the food for all of them in order to nurture them and make them grow. On the other side, he needs to bring mud in order to make sure that the nest is being closed and nobody can really step in. So really a tough life and a hard-working life, but he's perfectly prepared by evolution to do this task. And this is a perfect example of functional design. It's his beacon. And his beacon is very hard on the outside in order to be able to crack nuts and fruit. On the other side, he can bring all the mud. On the other side, he has a big resonance body on top of it in order to enhance the major core and be really impressive, and it looks great on the outside. So what a great design that is also light because this bird needs to fly, so it has a mesh interior material. On the outside, it's, it's hard. On the inside, it's being stiffened, but it's still hollow and therefore lightweight. A great example of nature that we can take great advantage of because we also build birds, right? These are the planes that we build in our industries, and they exactly have to follow the same principles. If you look more into detail at this metallic bird's nose, we have a radum right at the front of an aircraft. And this radum needs to protect the antenna inside. It needs to be also hard, hardened in, co in case of a subject attaching this during, uh, uh, tackling this during the flight. It has to be prone to impacts, and it has to also let through the, uh, the, the, the radar waves that are required in order to steer the plane or to hold up communications. And it needs to be lightweight because this plane needs to fly efficiently. And the question is, how nowadays, using principles of nature, do we design such a device? And when it comes to designing such devices, we do it differently compared to the past. Today, we do it digitally. We don't do prototypes and, you know, physical design in the first place anymore. We go to design systems, the like CAD systems that shows the front of the plane here right now, and we can see now how the design process actually works. We come from the cone, and they use the biological principle of a honeycomb structure that the bees have invented because we know it's very stiff and it's lightweight because in the middle there is no material. So we use this and project it onto the cone, and then afterwards we add an additional layer to it. Now we have the first design that is going to be used to create this radom and be attached to the plane. We need to, in the next step, also make sure that the design that we've initially done in the CAD system actually works. And there we go to the next step, which is the verification process, the simulation in order to verify why Im if impact-related um, uh, situations can harm this radom or whether it withstands it. And here in this case, we see the simulation of a bird's impact via a sphere, and we see the deformation of the part associated to this part. And if we see that the specifications are not being made, we go back to the design phase and we redesign, and then we do the simulation again. That's what this principle is all about. And then we come up with something that we call the digital twin of the product, in this case, the digital twin of the radar. In principle, a digital twin of a product is a very complex matter. It consists of mechanical, electronics, and software part. Of course, for this radome, there is only a mechanical part attached to it. So we know now what to produce. And by the way, just to pick another example of generative design capabilities that imitate um, uh, biological mechanisms, this is a part of uh, the, the landing gear mechanism of an aircraft. And you see a part that we want to optimize via biological and generative design um, capabilities. So here we see how the outer shape of the part or the area where this part could reside um, is going to be. Then an algorithm goes over it and, like nature, optimizes des the design. And what we can see, the outcome actually is something that looks like a pair of bones that somehow are being stuck together. 
So we can see that Etcher Nature did a great job in terms of optimizing from material strength and a material consumption perspective, uh, has been optimizing things over millions of years, uh, and Nature has been doing many, many things right. Going back to the radar, we now have this digital twin of the radar, and we need to ask ourselves, how are we going to produce it and build it? And there we produce in the next step the digital twin of the production. So the digital twin of the system that's going to produce this radar. And we can go there very far through simulation of individual parts, cells, whole lines in a complex manufacturing environment. But for this radar, we've decided to use a 3D additive manufacturing printer, which is in fact a robot. And this robot is um, is, is steered and is, 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 is uh, controlled by a Siemens Sinomeric system in order to have a very high precision um, kind of, kind of uh, uh, manufacturing capability. And you can see how here, step by step, this radium is being made out of composite material. In the first place, the cone is being printed. Now, the honeycomb structure is being printed on top of it. These are shapes that we've never been able to produce before. And now we are able to produce this nature-like shapes and optimized shapes in a way that was, not, ne was never possible before. And in the next step, of course, on top of the honeycombs, the second layer is going to be printed so that we have a radom nose made of uh, entirely composite material with a very complex and lightweight structure. And in the next step, we see then how this transfers into the real world which is the real production. So we see the robot where we simulated the production process in the past in this previous video. Now in real life, the cone is being built and you can see an actual part here in my hand. Uh, and uh, if you're interested, you can of course come forward then later on and uh, feel how, how lightweight this is. Um, then the honeycomb structure is being printed on the top of it and then right at the end, the outer shell is obviously being uh, attached to it and this works in one printing process that creates a shape that we've never been able to do before. So now we have the printed part. And now this printed part, like any complex product, goes into real life. And also the production runs and produces one part after the other. And what we can do now, and that's another step in kind of the evolutionary approach, we can attach the products and the production to the Internet of Things. We can extract the data out of running systems. Nature does it in that way that a species that is not adapted to the environment dies out. In our case, we take the data, we analyze the data, and with this data we can do something very, very fantastic. We can create a digital twin of performance that represents the capabilities and the performance of product and production in the real world. And then we can do something that nature does because there's a feedback loop. In nature, it's the die out, that's the evolutionary process. In our case, it's the digital feedback into the digital twin of the product and production in order to continuously improve both product and production. And this is the way how we, in principle, copy an evolutionary process. But in our case, it doesn't take millions of years and hundreds of generations. In our case, it can take hours just to get certain products improved very rapidly in, uh, in terms of an optimized production process and product design and performance. Let's look at a second example, which is a very, very exciting one, which tells us what we can do with evolutionary approaches and with additive manufacturing that gives us the capability to recreate entirely new designs. We talk about a burner system here, a burner that's usually being used in refinery industries. And on the right-hand side, uh, both water and, and the reactive material is being injected, and it burns on the left-hand side at the burner tip, where the reactive material comes out, is being inflamed, and where also water has to be applied in order to cool down this high-temperature burner. There are extremely high temperatures present there. This is the conventional design, and here you can see in blue where the water is being injected to cool down the burner tip to make the tip not melt in, under these very harsh conditions. If you apply nature's generative design capabilities and principles to it, you come up with a fundamentally different kind of approach, and we go into detail now how that works. It is what we call a fennel burner. 
because the design reminds us very strongly of the design of what nature did in the case of fennel. Not for cooking, in this case for refinery purposes. And we can see here how it works. This is the simulation. On the left-hand side, the reactive material is being injected. It goes through all these channels, and the aim is that on the, uh, on the outside, wherever the material comes out, there has to be a vortex flow, which should be as perfect as possible with very high speed in order to get the material out and have efficient burning there. On the right-hand side, we can see the simulation of the water coming in. That's the cooling water, and that needs to be with homogeneous speed and homogeneous distribution injected into uh, the lower area of the burner in order to have a, as far as possible perfect cooling. How do we get to this design now? That's the question. And there we apply the principles of evolution. We see that in the next step. Here we see in the four quadrants on the upper left-hand side the system that generates different design parameters that are possible for this burner. It's, if you wish, the DNA of the burner. And the solver creates all different kinds of possibilities of this DNA and all these, these parameters in order to get all possible design uh, solutions uh, calculated through. Then automatically, this is being transferred via a CAD system into a geometry that on the bottom right-hand side is being simulated in terms of effectiveness of the cooling. So homogeneity of uh, the water flow going through represented by the velocity of the cooling water that, that is in the tip of the, of the burner. And on the right-hand side, we get an indication whether the solutions that we have in place and that we are currently represented by each and every spot are calculating whether they are converging or not. The ones that don't converge are obviously being discarded, the other ones we take. And we see that through this process, we get a pre clear optimum, this evolutionary process that we're going through. And this optimum we're taking for the, um, for the final design of this burner. That's the principle. So the outcome is conventional design on the left-hand side, length of this product, 3.4 meters. On the right-hand side, we have our fennel burner that is admittedly by far more complex from the inside. The length is reduced by a factor of two, so 1.7 meters. 50% less parts, 90% simpler, and up to 60% lower manufacturing costs. That's the result, and that's the plastics representation of this burner. Again, who's interested is more than welcome to uh, come here afterwards and have a look at it. So it's really fantastic what can be achieved by looking at nature looking at generative design capabilities, simulation, and this evolutionary process that quickly drives us forward in terms of optimization of the design. So, all in all, the bionic approach accelerates industry 4.0 pretty much, and there's more and more principles that we can apply. And here it's about applying functional designs that are obviously um, uh, inspired by nature. Production and product are being perfected and optimized by emulating an evolutionary process. And additive manufacturing gives us the capability to really implement and realize designs that we've never seen before and that are very close to nature's examples and, and great examples that we're seeing there. Thank you very much. Siemens. Ingenuity for life.